Jack Park. Thank you. Um, how do we make this full? What do you want to do? Make it. Oh, it is. Never mind. It's all magic. Okay. <clears throat> if I had a synthesis of what I've heard today, it would go something like this. <clears throat> I appear to need to create a fuzzy container in which I have a dialogue with my crispers. Now, <clears throat> I didn't even know I had crispers, and maybe I don't, but that's what I learned today. I want to use that, that, that point about I want to use that point about the, 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 the fuzzy um, container for dialogue and, and just bookmark for you a term, a technology. It's called conversation theory. It was created by the cybernetician um, Gordon Pask, <clears throat> in which, in this, in this theory, he's, he's, he talks about speakers and listeners. And a speaker has a model of the world and a model of the listener. And he uses the model of the listener to tailor how the words come out. The listener has a model of the world. <clears throat> and the interaction between the two, and, and, and uh, this was a, a very important point made by Frode early, is that the secret's in the interaction. Gordon Pask spoke about this interaction space that occurs between the speaker and the listener, which he called an entailment mesh. An entailment mesh you could think of as a graph, a growing graph that they are co-creating, which represents the, the relationships that are in the conversation. I just wanted to bookmark that concept because it applies to many of the talks we heard today. Now about my talk, <clears throat> it's going to be very short and mostly philosophical. I, I did not plan to talk today in a technical sense, but I, I had a couple of points I wanted to make. Um, you may recognize that I am using the same tool that Jeff Conklin uses, and I have to tell you that I wouldn't know how to use this tool if I had not taken Jeff Conklin's courses in dialogue mapping. That's exactly what you're looking at is a dialogue or sometimes called an issue map. And it's made on the open source platform called Compendium, which is available online from the Open University in the UK. Um, and Jeff actually had a lot to do with the creation of Compendium in the earliest of its days. What I have here is a narrative arc that is my interpretation of the Engelbart story. It, it begins on the left side, the present situation, that acknowledges that we are storytellers and that we have these problems to solve. They may be wicked, they may be tame. The wicked ones are the ones we should care about. And there is room for improvement in our tool capabilities and our human capabilities. You may recall that the Engelbart story is, is that you need to co-evolve the tools and the human capabilities together. And so there's this narrative arc to a desired situation where we have the improved tool capabilities and the improved human capabilities. And I, I, I offer a couple of suggestions of what that may entail. For example, findable information resources, which implies well-organized information resources, improved authoring tools, and you've heard about those today, improved human capabilities, is that we are, A, better storytellers, and we get there by being better relational thinkers. So if, if, I, if I use uh, the little symbol in the upper left-hand corner is, is the compendium symbol for a map. So if we think of this as a map, I will now go inside that map uh, with a couple of questions. And the first one is what? And I've used, oh, that's really sad. It's, it's, um, it's confusing. It's put Edna St. Vincent Millay up inside the text. Um, it's, it's the last stanza. Can, quick? Can you? Yeah. The last stanza in her poem. Oh, that was nice. Uh, <clears throat> he's the man. Uh, Wisdom enough to leech us of our ill is daily spun, but there exists no loom to weave it into fabric. And I believe that is the what. We are building looms to weave 
the information and the knowledge that we do have, the intellect that we possess, into a fabric. And that fabric is not going to be a trivial 2D fabric. It's going to be very high dimensional. Now, I want to talk to you about why we're doing it. Um, I use this picture because it's, it, in my opinion, it, it conveys the idea of a moral sense to what we're doing. We have to do this. Now, the picture is, is that of a 40-something father of two who is in a hospital bed with ALS. Now, this was a, a, a funded, uh, I, I contributed to that fund um, to, to fund research for ALS. Now, the story, the reason I care about this, and it, maybe it's only me, the reason I care about this is because 26 years ago, I was in that bed. I had a cancer. Now, the difference between this gentleman and me is that I was able to get out of that bed. He probably will never get out of that bed. I was able to go out and do my research and work with a lot of MDs, and I'm here today to talk to you about it, okay? He's never going to have that shot. Now, we could, we could work to giving him that shot, and we've got to do that by improving our tools and our capabilities. That's the point of my talk. And the how? Let's just do it. Let's roll. That's my talk. Questions? Oh, come on. If you don't have any questions, I'm going to start, you know, picking on you and, and making you come up with questions. Yes, Phil. What can you do? Bill, I'd like to say you just keep being Bill and doing what you do because it's so useful, okay? But let's start, let's, let's take it a little further. This is, this is a room of overeducated, overachievers. And it means that we have this opportunity to do some things. Sam and, and Dino and Froda are talking about something they call the DKR2. This is, would be... The, the, the concept of the Engelbartian dynamic knowledge repository, which, which I call a knowledge garden. It doesn't make any difference. It's just a different name for the same concept, which is people, their knowledge, and their tools co-evolving together in the context of wicked problems. Okay? So what can we do? We can join these projects. In my own case, the fact that uh, the, uh, the previous picture, let me see if I can go back to it. Can I? Yeah, it's good time. I'll go back. My memory. Oh. There. Um, I'm one of, I would say, around two dozen entities on this planet who are building open source Watsons. You may recall that Watson is this program that, that uh, this computer system that IBM built that won the game of Jeopardy and it's now doing such things as working in cancer research and so on and so forth. But most of us believe that we'll never be able to afford access to Watson so let's build our own and we can. And there's, uh, there's at least a dozen, possibly twice that entities. The entire nation of Japan has started such a project. Um, we can start our own projects individually, or we can find projects to join and contribute to in any way we can. I hope that answers your question, Bill. I see this picture, and you can relate to this picture. I can relate to this picture. I feel like you're a very empathetic human being. So my question is that what is the future of empathy in the role of future you want to see or create? That's a really good question. Um, let me answer it this way, and I don't know if it's the right answer, it's just how I see it. It's like I pulled a six gun out and I'm shooting. It, it <coughs> not everybody on this planet can experience what you experienced and what I experienced and be empathetic. They can't. And I don't ask them to. What I do is I ask 
of those who have the capability to use it to the deepest degree they can. Now, we give them opportunities by creating funding situations where they can shed some dollars out of their pocket and make some kind of a difference. I strongly believe in what this funded project is doing. I also believe that, that this entity that is emerging between Froda and Sam and Dino and a few of the others, we, we sometimes actually meet every other year in Dubrovnik and, and, and talk about this. My point is there are entities emerging that are here to foster exactly what you're talking about. I, I hope that answers it. Rob, you're going to get a microphone. I have two questions. Uh, the first was, on your very first slide, you gave your association a, included something called kindy. So oh, what yes. is that? And the second question is just, you've talked about the, as you called it, fuzzy container, the knowledge garden. Could you expand a little bit on that? Thank you. Um, okay, so in my effort to um, promote the idea of knowledge gardening, which I first sort of used publicly in a, uh, an invited talk in Seoul, South Korea in 2007, um, I've been trying to, I've been, my wife and I have started a, a, a nonprofit, which is called Topic Quest Foundation, the idea being is it, it, it wants to become a source of energy for what I call a knowledge garden. And what is a knowledge garden? It's a DKR, a dynamic knowledge repository. In my, in my implementation, it, it envisions a knowledge federation, a, a way of a digital library which federates the work of epistemic or knowledge communities all over the planet, brings them together in such a way that different communities will begin to see wormholes into the thoughts of other communities. And that's how, at a global scale, we can bring a lot of people together. That's the knowledge garden part. Um, Kindy goes back in the knowledge engineering field to the likes of John F. Soa, who has written an awful lot on knowledge engineering, ontology engineering, so forth, and his partner, uh, Aaron Majumdar. Well, Aaron has formed a new company here in Palo Alto called Kindy. And they've, they've, they've got me on contract. They say they're going to hire me as, as a uh, senior knowledge engineer. What is Kindy? Kindy is a closed source Watson. And uh, they hired me because they wanted my open source components in the closed source platform, but they're willing to share some of the closed source components to the open source platform. Kindy has the ability to read text and notice things that others didn't. As a simple example is, is that it read the protocols of a husband and wife who were interviewed after they went to a police station reporting that their child had been abducted. And this was an eight-year-old cold case. Kindy read their protocols and said that the parents were lying, and the child was still on the property, and in fact, it was. Thank you very much, Doug.